have one more one more talk uh, before the lunch break. Our next speaker is Brian Keane. Uh, Brian is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School here at Rutgers. He got his PhD in philosophy here at Rutgers in 2009 with Zenon serving on his committee. Where is Zenon? Uh, I'm going to give you a nice long introduction now. Um, I, I think we can continue on with the introduction since Zenon knows who Brian is. Um, uh, Brian is an expert on visual cognition. But also, and I think uniquely here uh, at today's meeting, he is an expert on the interaction between vision and psychopathology, as he's been exploring visual cognition in patients with disorders such as schizophrenia and body dysmorphic disorder. Um, it's also important, I think, to note that Brian is twice the scholar of anyone else in this room. I think all of our speakers have earned a PhD, but that wasn't good enough uh, for Brian. Brian has earned two PhDs so far. Uh, two um, uh, after his uh, philosophy PhD uh, here at Rutgers, he went on and earned a psychology PhD at uh, UCLA working with uh, Phil Kelman. And he's going to be talking today about contour interpolation. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you also for the introduction, Brian. Um, so, yeah, the title of today, uh, today's talk is Contra Interpolation, a uh, case studying uh, cognitive impenetrability, as you can see on the title slide here. Um, so I'm going to first kind of describe what impenetrability is. Uh, I think this slide might be unnecessary since Brian had a nice introduction and this topic has already been introduced. Uh, but just in case some of you might have not been here for some reason, this is a, t uh, uh, a quote from uh, Zenon's paper on PBS in 1999. Uh, and he says, an important part of visual perception corresponding to what some people have called early vision is prohibited from accessing knowledge of the patient, knowledge of the utility, and determining the function it can use. So uh, he goes on to make some uh, uh, elaborations to this view. For example, attention is allowed to modulate the uh, inputs to uh, early vision, and the outputs of early vision also can be uh, modified through cognition. But early vision proper is, is uh, impenetrable um, from uh, cognition. So um, debates thus far have been framed very generally. We're talking about uh, people talking about the entirety of vision or the entirety of early vision. And um, that is an interesting place to start. But I actually think that um, what we need are some detailed case studies. So let's look at one process uh, in depth to see if it qualifies as cognitively impenetrable in uh, Zenon's sense of the term. Um, so I argue that it's actually useful to look at one process at a time and to look at it in depth um, because uh, in order to show conclusively that early vision or vision is impenetrable, you first want to really show uh, that one process is cognitively impenetrable. So that's what I'm going to be doing here is I'll be looking at one specific process that I've studied in depth for, uh, for about 12 years and to provide some evidence that it does uh, indeed count as cognitively imp uh, impenetrable. So the process of interest uh, for today's talk, as you might have um, seen from that title slide, is that of contour interpolation. So contour interpolation represents physically non-visible um, contours and surfaces on the basis of how surrounding visible edges are arranged. So um, this is a, cl a classic uh, Kinesis square, a visually completed shape. Uh, these are inducing edges, sometimes they're called inducers, and these uh, produce these interpolated contours around the perimeter and they encompass a single visually completed shape. Um, so I'm going to be using the term interpolation in a very generic sense. So uh, for example, these are modal, modal and amodal uh, squares that uh, Kinesa um, uh, discovered. Um, and uh, you can see down here, there are these contours that are forming that, uh, behind a whole surface, I guess, uh, and there's a, a dark backdrop. There are also these Gabor patches, which are or these oriented elements. Uh, which form chains, which in turn form shapes. That counts as interpolation in the sense that I'm using it. And also, the, there are these dotted lines, which Charlie Gilbert has used in his um, elegant studies in single cell, uh, using single cell neurophysiology um, in non human primates. And then uh, another example would be this motion looking paradigm, which looks pretty much invisible here, <laughs> but there should be four uh, occluding squares that uh, block each of these um, corners of this diamond. 
Uh, so all of these count as interpolation. There are other cases too where uh, where your brain automatically forms these these contours from these discontinuous edge elements. So you know there are a lot of processes that I could be looking at. So why is it that we're specifically focused on contour interpolation? Um, one very simple reason is just that it's important for normal seeing. So it extracts fundamental uh, properties of the objects that we visually confront. Um, so for example, it helps extract properties such as object shape, object position, and object number. So here we see three uh, circles, obviously, uh, and then rather than just seeing those same three circles change their shape, we see a fourth object, a triangle, that's placed on top of them. Um, another uh, kind of less appreciated or less, uh, less talked about uh, property of objects that's extracted via interpolation is that of object persistence. So this is a nice demo by uh, Evan Palmer and colleagues. And um, you see here a kind of a kidney bean that's kind of translating back and forth be, be, uh, behind a hold occluder. And um, so rather than seeing a, a kaleidoscope of individual elements that uh, appear and disappear, you see a single object, different parts of which appear at different points in time. So you get to have this percept in virtue of the edge elements that appear uh, across space and time. So yet another reason to look at uh, contour interpolation is that we know a whole lot about it. So it's been studied since uh, the, at least the 1950s by Gaetano Canisa and, and others. Um, and um, so what I did is I just hopped on to PubMed and did a search for key terms. And uh, the key terms I used were contour integration, illusory contours, amoeba completion, moa completion, um, subjective contours, contour interpolation, contour completion, and boundary completion. So uh, a lot of uh, elements in that disjunction. Uh, and what I came up with was over 800 articles um, on PubMed. Uh, and actually, uh, this is a dramatic underestimation of the literature on this topic. So for example, um, it doesn't include non-English journals or books. Um, and also, I could have used other key terms, such as perceptual completion, visual completion, phenomenal contours, quasi-perceptive contours, visual binding, and feature binding others. So the jury should now be in. We should now have enough information to determine whether contour interpolation counts as a cognitively impenetrable process. So the agenda for today's uh, talk is as follows. First I'm going to start with a little bit of a sanity check to just provide some just suggested ev evidence to think that it's reasonable to believe that contour interpolation does indeed count as an impenetrable process. Um, then I'll provide some behavioral evidence from my own work and from the, from the work of others to show that interpolation is uh, impenetrable. And then I'll uh, discuss some uh, two very interesting, I think, uh, caveats or qualifications to the impenetrability view, which might even add another uh, item on the checklist uh, of Firestone and Scholl. Uh, and then, of course, I'll end with a, a personal note uh, on the tremendous influence that Zen has had on my career, both in the topics that I'm um, interested in and also in the approach that I take to understanding um, um, these questions. So the first uh, piece of uh, suggestive evidence is that uh, interpolation is actually a lightning-fast process. Um, so there's a, a lot of literature on this, but one nice study comes from Lee and Wen in 2001 in PNAS. Uh, and they, it was a single-cell study, not human primates. Uh, and what they did is they had these cells whose receptive fields would fall on these illusory contours, or on these amoeba contours, or on no contours. So this is a rotating uh, corner control condition. Um, and uh, they, they uh, plot the average firing rate on the uh, y-axis and the post-stimulus time on the x-axis. And you can see that the mobile, uh, the amoeba and the illusory contour uh, firing rate separates from the rotating corner control condition within 50 milliseconds. So you get a separation on how these cells are responding within 50 milliseconds of post-stimulus onset. So that's, that's, that's fast. And so the argument is that, well, how could it be the case that we could deploy conceptual knowledge within these very ta fast time frames? It would seem to be uh, uh, an unlikely thing. Another piece of uh, 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 evidence that just suggests that it's reasonable to think that interpolation is encapsulated is that the, initi the initiating conditions for the process cannot be introspected. So um, um, we cannot just through introspection or through consulting our own uh, minds determine the conditions that uh, allow or prohibit or, or alter the interpolation process. We must actually conduct experiments to figure out what these conditions are. And it's turning out that the conditions that alter interpolation are surprisingly complex. Um, so it includes uh, property changes such as luminance, motion, spatial frequency, eccentricity, 
eye movements, and subtle changes in junction structure and global layout actually have tremendous effect on this interpolation process. So uh, again, this would be something that would be well suited for a uh, kind of a modularized, uh, kind of kindly impenetrable uh, uh, mechanism. Another piece of evidence is just that some some uh, cases um, uh, your common sense knowledge is just blatantly ignored. So here your brain wants to say, okay, there's an element here, it's geometrically uh, arranged appropriately to this element here. I want to see this guy as having a seven foot arm. But of course, we know that people don't have seven foot arms, but the interpolation process doesn't care about this knowledge, and it does its own thing. Here's another example that Zenon had uh, put in the 1999 article. It was first introduced by Kinesa in its 1985 paper, Seeing and Thinking. So here, um, you know, contextual regularity shouldn't tell us to see a third octagon here in the center, but of course that's not what we see. Our brains want to complete these into right angles behind each of these two occluders. Another example, this is called a Freemish uh, crate. And so um, this is uh, an example where you kind of cut out these chunks of the uh, crate, mm -hmm. and if you do it from the right angle, this uh, kind of chunk, this uh, missing part, well, um, you can see this contour here behind this missing part, and you can see this contour down here behind this missing part. So let's see what that looks like. So you basically get a physically impossible square. So your original system says, okay, well, these are lined up in the right way uh, to promote uh, uh, completion. Uh, and even though that creates an impossible figure, your original system doesn't care. It just wants to create this shape anyway. Um, so more evidence comes from um, our friend at multiple object tracking. We actually call this multiple vertex tracking because the elements that are tracked are actually Pac-Man, as you'll see. Uh, and this is a variation of the very nice uh, 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 paradigm uh, invented by Scholl, Bush, and Feldman in 2000 called target merging, as some of you might be familiar with. Um, and basically, on each trial of this experiment, um, what would happen is you would have a target extractor in each, each uh, quadrant, and the target would briefly blink. And then all elements would transform into Pac-Man. They'd start orbiting within their respective quadrants for eight to nine seconds. they transform back into uh, disks. And then subjects would have to choose the target that they saw at the beginning of the trial. Um, so rather than, um, all right. So the conditions that we had uh, were determined by how the Pac-Man were oriented relative to, to one another in the different <coughs> um, So uh, these four for the target extractor interpolation condition, you have uh, these four targets. And you can see that this target is interpolating with this distractor, and this distractor, and this target is interpolating with this distractor, and this distractor. So you have these two morphing illusory quadrilaterals, which are composed of two uh, targets and two distractors. So the idea is that um, there's going to be this automatic grouping that's going to shift your attention from the targets to the distractors. It's going to make it harder to keep track of these items. Um, and that, that's what should be the case, that this interpolation process is automatic and, and impervious to the desires of the, of the uh, observer who's trying to track as well as possible. Um, so here's the uh, uh, demo for this. So the tracked objects are the um, ones that blink. I'm going to repeat this, as I'm sure some of you missed that uh, target designation phase. Um, but those are the targets. So let's watch it again. So the targets are going to blink. And um, what's going to happen is you're eventually, for many of you, you're those, at least one of those targets is going to form an illusory contour with one of the distractors that you accidentally trap. Let's try that again. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think uh, Brian showed me the next point that if an effect is real, you should be able to feel it. And I think that in this case, you can feel the effect of the illusory contours kind of tugging your attention away from a target toward the destructor. Um, we also had a related condition, which is the target interpolate condition, and this one just involves all for the targets um, designated by the arrows here, and then interpolating one quadrilateral and the distractors forming the alternative quadrilateral. And this was expected to be a bit easier since you can automatically group the targets into kind of one object and that would facilitate your tracking accuracy. So here's the target interpolate condition. And so you have this one morphing illusory quadrilateral and um, subjects do, uh, do better on this. Uh, and uh, we also had control conditions, which were exactly the same as what I just showed you, except the Pac-Man were flipped 180 degrees 
uh, to prevent any form of illusory contour formation. Um, we did this both for the target structure condition and also um, for the um, target uh, interpolate condition. Uh, so I skipped through those because I want to make sure I get through all the slides here. Um, so the per uh, percent targets identified is on the uh, y-axis. So the target's interpolate condition where all the targets kind of group into one quadrilateral is here. So performance is better than this than it is on the control, but the effect is rather small. Um, but for the target distractor interpolate, um, that condition was significantly uh, uh, harder than the control condition where they are all flipped outward. And most importantly, although the, the, it doesn't look like it from the slide, the effect was very consistent. So out of 16 observers, we got uh, 15 of them actually showed this interaction. So it's a very consistent effect that we found through these illusory contours. Um, to further kind of show that these contours were indeed producing the effects of interest, uh, what we did is we modulated the strength of illusory contour formation by simply uh, uh, changing the rotation angles of the Pac-Man. So if you curve them a little bit, you should weaken the contour. And if you uh, curve, if you um, rotate the Pac-Man significantly, you'll break the formation of illusory contours and you'll eliminate the relevance of them for tracking. Um, so that's actually what we found. So if you have a large rotation angle, then there's, you, can, you can experience it for yourself. There's no illusory contours here, and it shouldn't affect your performance on the, uh, on the task. Uh, and that is indeed what we found. So percent targets identified is on the uh, y-axis, and user rotation angle uh, is on the x-axis. And so when you go from zero degrees of rotation between the target interpolate condition and the target distractor interpolate condition, you get a nice effect, and that effect becomes zero when you go to 48 degrees of rotation, which breaks the illusory contours and therefore eliminates the effect on tracking. So the conclusions from this study um, is that uh, interpolated contours are used uh, despite being objectively irrelevant to the task. We never told subjects anything about contours or quadrilaterals during the task. We just said, track the objects, the objects were turned into pac um, So despite that, uh, and despite this effect being deleterious in certain conditions, subject could not escape the illusory contours. They used them uh, despite it impairing performance. Uh, and this impairment can be modulated in bottom-up stimulus-driven fashion. So if you weaken the contours, you weaken the effect on traffic. Uh, I'm also going to talk now about um, some behavioral evidence from priming, um, where subjects can potentially try to use their conceptual knowledge to complete an object to help them in a task. And, and, and uh, we're going to start with a little uh, challenge here. So I'm giving you uh, the knowledge of what a completed shape looks like. This is what the shape is going to look like. It's this diamond shape. And I want you to try to use that knowledge to determine uh, how this um, object, this partly visible object, is moving. So I'm going to exit out of here. Okay, so I gave you the knowledge. You should, I want you to deploy the knowledge of what the completed shape looks like to tell me how this object is moving. So I'll give you a hint, the object is either orbit, it's orbiting upright and it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. And Kent, who thinks that it's going clockwise? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's going counterclockwise? And who's not sure? Okay. So um, this demo, I have to give credit to um, Josh McDermott, who made these back in 2001, I believe, um, shows the importance of occlusion. So simply by adding occluders, you kind of clear up any order of ownership ambiguities. And it becomes very clear that this is orbiting uh, counterclockwise. And then if you change the direction, it becomes very clear that it's clockwise. And then if I remove the um, occluders, you have you know, blue <laughs> what this is. And so, once again, I gave you the knowledge of what the shape looked like, but you couldn't really use that knowledge to help you in the task. And so, once again, you should be able to feel this effect or back the road. Mm. Um, go back to my presentation. Um, so uh, what uh, Lorenzo and Lace did a paper on nature of neuroscience in 2001 is they actually compared performance in one of two cases. They either gave subjects a priming stimulus before each trial for one second, uh, or they gave them no priming stimulus. And they compared their performance and kind of trying to figure out whether these perfectly visible shapes 
We're orbiting clockwise or counterclockwise. And percent correct is on the y-axis, ranging from guessing, which is 50%, all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, and you can see that performance with priming is actually exactly the same as performance without priming. So these, are, these bars to the left are with priming, and the bars to the right are without priming. And actually, priming offers no benefit. So just by knowing what the object really looks like doesn't help your performance on this task. Um, so there's more evidence I would like to go into, but because of time constraints, I'm going to jump to, to the two caveats which are really important to keep in mind when we're evaluating the impenetrability hypothesis in the context of interpolation. Um, and one caveat is that um, cognitive strategy um, alters the recognition of interpolated shapes. Uh, however, this does, not, this, um, uh, this does not mean that interpolation itself is altered in any way. And um, so I'm going to clarify what I mean by this by adverting to a uh, study that we have in uh, Cognition 2012 where we uh, manipulated cognitive strategy to see uh, what effect, if any, that would have on illusory contour formation and illusory shape discrimination. Um, so um, we, in this uh, study, we had two types of discrimination tasks. One of them was a relatable condition, and the subject had to say fat or thin. And by relatable, it just means that the, uh, the elements that were visible, the edge elements, were geometrically related to ordinarily produce illusory contours. Uh, and the, no, the uh, non-relatable condition, the edge elements were oriented to ordinarily block illusory contour formation. But in each of these two cases, subjects had to say fat or thin, depending on how the shape looked to them. Um, in each case, these uh, shape alternatives, fat or thin, derived from what we call a standard shape. So let's uh, show these standard shapes. So this is a relatable standard shape, and these are four anchor points. And what we would do is we would shift these anchor points inward or outward to create a fat or thin shape. So that's fat thin, fat thin. And on each trial, they would see partly visible versions of these fat or thin shapes. Um, so uh, to make these shapes partly visible, we would place them on top of these teardrop backgrounds. And so what you would see is just the four corners here kind of lurking and peeking out from behind. And what's important here is that your visual system is getting these relatable edges, such that they can form illusory contours on the left, they can form illusory contours on the right, and you could potentially use those contours to help you in the discrimination path. Same thing with a thin uh, condition, or sorry, the thin uh, alternative. You place that on top of this teardrop background so that it becomes perfectly visible, and you get these illusory contours ordinarily uh, so that you can use those contours to help you make the decision about fat or thin. For the non-relatable uh, con uh, condition, uh, we also use the standard shape. And we also have these same four anchor points. So I'm just kind of toggling between the two standard shapes here to see how similar these are to one another. Um, and um, what we would do is we would take these four anchor points and we ship them in or out to create a fat or thin alternative. So uh, this is a thin shape, this is fat. And so again, we're toggling those same four anchor points to create the shape alternative. We did this by varying magnitudes using the method of constant stimuli. Uh, and as before, you just place these shapes on top of this teardrop background, so you get the four corners in each case. But what's important here is that geometric configuration uh, ordinarily prohibits illusory contour formation here on the left and here on the right, so you cannot uh, make use of such contours when doing the discrimination task. Same thing with the thin task, if you put it on, uh, sorry, the thin alternative, if you put it on top of these teardrop backgrounds, there are uh, no illusory contours that are forming on the left and right because of the geometric arrangement of those edge elements. Um, so we basically got subjects to uh, use one of two strategies, and we had a, a between-subject uh, approach here. Um, so 45 subjects were uh, biased to treat the, the visible fragments of these shapes as being unitary, it's just forming a single object. Uh, we did this through showing them pictures uh, at the, in the instruction phase of a trial and also just giving them verbal instructions about what they're seeing. And then for the ungrouped subjects, they were uh, biased to see these visible uh, edge elements as being disconnected, as, as not forming a single shape. Um, so let me show you the instructional kind of picture or templates that we use to kind of bias a grouping strategy. Um, so in the grouping strategy, you say, hey, look, this is what you're looking at. You're looking at the fat shape, you're looking at the thin shape, and you only can see parts of these shapes, but you have to try to discriminate them. And then for the ungrouped strategy, we would say, um, this, you're actually seeing these four disconnected elements, and you have to say whether these elements are fat or thin, and so this is a fat and this is thin. So they would just think that these are, again, disconnected. 
But what's important for, for this study is that the parts of the ungrouped strategy template correspond to the parts of the group template that would be visible when placed over the teardrop background. So they put the teardrop background there. The two templates are identical. It's only how they're kind of conceptualizing the stimulus that uh, that's going to differ here between these two conditions. Um, and so the same thing with the non-relatable templates, where they could use unitary shapes, um, kind of uh, advise them to see them as, as, as all connected, or they could have these uh, fragmented templates. If you place them over the, the fragmented uh, background, then it becomes identical. And so again, we're changing how they're conceptualizing the stimulus. Um, so you might be wondering yourself, okay, you know, they're showing these subjects these fragmented templates. This seems really hard to distinguish from one another. How how can we really tell the difference between ungrouped, you know, fat template and ungrouped thin template? And so actually, um, what we did is we just showed them these kind of back and forth movies. That, okay, this is how the fat and thin differ for the relatable. And you show them this for a while. Say, okay, yeah, I get it. It's pretty clear now. <coughs> and then we do the same thing with the non-relatable. Show them back and forth. So, okay, I see. Just kind of see whether these fragments are fat or thin, and just focus on these four corners of the, uh, of the stimulus. Um, so in half the trials, we used distractor lines. And um, these uh, distractor lines were fixed uh, in a fixed position. They weren't changing location or anything. And they uh, appeared just within the uh, contours of a fat shape or just outside of the contours of a thin shape. Uh, we did this for the relatable condition and also the non-relatable condition. Um, so we measured filling in of the illusory contours by the amount by which the, the distractor lines altered performance. So prior studies have shown that these distractor lines disrupt the formation of illusory contours and thereby make it harder to discriminate illusory shapes. However, these same distractor lines have no effect when there are no illusory contours there for them to disrupt. So again, the, uh, by, by placing um, kind of noise uh, or irrelevant information near the path of interpolation, you can kind of get a metric of how much they're filling in contours. Um, so you might be kind of wondering, so well, why are we doing this? Uh, and there's actually, as I was saying, a literature on this showing that when you add these distractor lines, it hurts you when they appear near your know, illusory contours, but they can be ignored when they appear in other places not near illusory contours. Uh, there are also reverse correlation studies using classification image technique that show when you embed these kinesis shapes and no, uh, luminous noise, and they discriminate these uh, um, fat and shapes over thousands of trials. You get these effects of the noise uh, pixels so even though they're objectively irrelevant, the visual system wants to kind of take into account what appears near the filled-in path when it's making a decision as to whether a shape is fat or thin. Um, so to make this even more intuitive, uh, I'm going to show you a nice um, uh, uh, figure by Ramachandran and colleagues in 1994. Uh, so this is a kinesis square. And if I place this kinesis square over a, a checkerboard background, it kind of becomes very vivid and it kind of pops out. So what's happening here is your visual system is automatically paying attention to seemingly irrelevant information in the background. If it's consistent with that, then it makes it vivid. But if it's inconsistent, the contours formed between these packets become much less uh, pronounced. And so again, the visual system uh, pays attention to the seemingly irrelevant information near the field of path and use that to measure um, the filling in of contours. So here are the results for this study. So D prime is shown on the y-axis, so obviously higher means better. Um, and um, we're showing you the data for the relatable condition from subjects who used the group strategy. So they were biased to see these edge elements as, as, as unitary. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, the uh, adding the distractor line worsens performance. Um, and so that indicates that there's a filling in contour there, uh, which is good. Uh, and then for the unrelatable case, adding the distractor lines actually had no effect. And this is kind of interesting because subjects were biased to conceptualize these contours as being in a specific location by, you know, by using these, these uh, templates. But yet, despite them kind of believing that these contours are in a specific location, that doesn't create these filling in effects through the distractor lines. The ungrouped strategy, I uh, hear the data. So uh, for the uh, no lines condition, that's better than the lines condition. Uh, and that also is interesting, because they don't believe that there's any contour there, but despite that disbelief, they're nonetheless being affected by the distractor lines that are appearing near the illusory contour. Um, and then for the unrelated condition, that's not really surprising. The subjects are able to ignore the distractor lines no matter what. 
And so in each of these two cases, we have a distractor line inter uh, interaction, such that the distractor lines affect performance when they're appearing near illusory contours, and they're not affecting performance otherwise. Uh, but of course, um, so let's compare the relatable, condition, or, um, the relatable conditions between the two um, the graphs. So here you can see that there's a pretty drastic, drastically different effect. So performance here is way better for the group subjects than it is for the ungroup subjects. But at the same time, the, um, uh, the unrelatable conditions are the same between the group and the ungroup strategy. So I'm going to say a little bit more about this. So first of all, the fact that the unrelatable condition is the same in each of these two cases means that it's, it's not true that using a fragmented template is intrinsically harder. Right? So these subjects are no disadvantage by using this template here, but they were at a disadvantage of using the template here. So what we argue is that these kind of templates are, are actually important for allowing observers to notice illusory contours and to take advantage of those contours for the purposes of illusory shape discrimination. So uh, to summarize the results, grouping did not alter the distractor line interaction, so we argue that uh, filling in happens no matter what. Um, grouping did not alter the unrelatable performance, so this means that just using a fragmented template is not intrinsically harder. Uh, however, grouping strategy did alter the relatable performance, such that uh, when subject was discriminating these illusory shapes, they were much better when, when they had a cognitive template that allowed them to notice the contours and use those contours for discrimination. So therefore, illusory contour formation and illusory shape discrimination can come apart. And when I first tell people this, you know, they're kind of confused because they're logically linked processes, right? To get to the shape, you need to form the contour. Uh, but we argue that there are actually two distinct stages. So you have an early, fast, automatic interpolation stage, and then you have a late kind of shape recognition stage, which is uh, conceptual in nature. Um, so to provide some further evidence of this association between illusory contour formation on the one hand and illusory shape discri uh, discrimination on the other, we uh, have a clinical study in which we ran schizophrenia patients and controls. And um, so these schizophrenia patients um, have classic symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, and also disorganized thinking. Um, and we asked them on uh, age, sex, and uh, level of parental education. Um, and we have, uh, we have them do a similar task where they have to discriminate kind of a fat shape over here or a thin shape over here. So they see one of these two shapes on each child to say which one they see. And uh, in some cases, these um, uh, stimuli are accompanied by distractor lines uh, to kind of get a, an index for the filling in of contour. And then for the non-relatable condition, you have these same four packing, except they were all pointed downward and they're rotated either a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. And so on each trial, they'd see one of these two uh, configurations, and they have to say left or right on each trial. Uh, and as before, we added distractor lines to get a gauge on the filling in of contour. And um, uh, we measure performance by uh, changing the uh, Pac-Man uh, rotational magnitude. So if you rotate the Pac-Man just a little bit, it becomes a hard task. If you rotate the Pac-Man a lot, it becomes a very easy task. It becomes very clear which one's fat and which one's thin. Um, and threshold corresponds to the amount of accuracy or amount of rotation needed for 80% accuracy. And we use the Bayesian adaptive uh, staircase procedure called the side method to estimate the threshold. Um, so, uh, I know I'm trying to conserve time, but these are two psychometric uh, curves one for a control and for a patient. The portion correct range is, I'm guessing, all up the ceiling. The Pac-Man rotational magnitude and log units is shown on the x axis. And so this control would have a threshold here of 0.6 log units, which is plus or minus 4 degrees of rotation. And the schizophrenia patient would have a higher threshold, would be doing worse, and have a, a threshold of 0.9 log units, which is plus or minus 8 degrees of rotation. So this is how we measure performance in this task. And um, so the surprising finding from this study is that our schizophrenia patients are behaving as if they're adopting steadfastly an ungrouped strategy. Um, so let me explain. So um, for the relatable um, condition, uh, when you go from having no distractor lines to distractor lines, you get a worsening of performance. Your thresholds increase. And for the unrelatable condition, uh, the distractor lines can readily be ignored. So that's a classic interaction effect that I was describing before. And that was good that we were finding that. However, the schizophrenia patient showed a, a, a pattern of performance that should re uh, remind us of the ungrouped subjects that we were discussing. So for the relatable condition, they have a normal reaction to the distractor lines, so the, the performance gets worse. In the unrelatable condition, there's no effect of distractor lines. 
uh, and then their near their overall <coughs> performance on the unrelatable condition is near normal, but the overall performance on the relatable condition is much worse. So to the conclusion that we draw from this is that schizophrenia patients are actually forming illusory contours, but they're not able to notice and use those contours to make these fine-grained shape discrimination um, uh, judgments. And what makes these results even more interesting is that the patients who most who showed this effect the most were those who had a clinical symptom called conceptual disorganization. So subjects who, who had a um, less an ability to clearly communicate or to think clearly were the ones who most, uh, most clearly exhibited this, uh, this sort of profile. So this further shows that there's kind of a conceptual stage to illusory shape discrimination that, um, that can be either intact or degraded depending on your mental status. Um, uh, there's another paper that I'm not going to be able to discuss that uses EEG, um, but they, um, they actually reached the same conclusion that uh, boundary formation is automatic and dissociable from illusory shape discrimination. That appeared in um, Journal of Neuroscience back in uh, 2006. Uh, Micka Murray was the first name on that one. So the interim summary caveat one is that interpolation ensues despite our beliefs. So if we believe that contours are there, but that geometry isn't going to allow for those contours, then you're not going to get the uh, filling in effects. Um, and if you don't believe that the, the contours are there, but the geometry does allow for those contours, then you will get the filling in effects. Um, at the same time, strategy is important. It alters how these contours are noticed and used. Therefore, contour filling in, but not shape discrimination, is cognitively encapsulated. And so this is an important caveat for those who wish to assess to what extent uh, interpolation is encapsulated. So caveat two is a little bit easier to explain, because I'm just going to use some basic examples, which I hope you'll appreciate. But what I'm going to argue is that cognition can generate non-interpolated or abstracted contours. And I think this is a really important point that's not discussed enough in the literature. Uh, abstracted contours are those that must be imagined or inferred from background knowledge or biases. So let's look, uh, look at some examples. So everybody has seen this. This is an uh, R.C. James Dalmatian dog uh, uh, picture. Uh, and I think uh, Gregory, um, uh, Gregory first, um, uh, Richard Gregory first came up with or showed this in his 1972 book, I Am Brain. And uh, so a large portions of this dog are not physically specified. You have to kind of cognitively infer the contours of this dog. And so, for example, its foot you might think is here, and so you can kind of represent the contours being here. But that's not interpolation. That's a contour abstraction process, we argue. Here's another case. These are Mooney figures. And I think these are actually related to um, the street completion figures that Zen has in his 1999 article. And so you know that this is a face, right? You can pick up on a feature here, and you can represent the entirety of the object. You can represent its contours maybe being up here somewhere. But that's not interpolation. That is contour abstraction, which is a different process. Um, these are pareidolia figures. So it's where you see meaning and meaningless things, um, similar to like Rorschach on test. Uh, so you might see kind of this is a rabbit eye, and these is two rabbit ears and it's paused and you're looking down here. So again, you can represent the contour of the object, but that again is not interpolation, that's contour abstraction. And here's another example where you can kind of cognitively infer where the dog is based on how you're not and how dogs typically look, but that's not interpolation, that is contour abstraction. This is yet yeah, another example of a Biedermann's classic article in 1987 on geons. He distinguishes uh, recoverable from non-recoverable shapes. This would be a non-recoverable shape. Does anybody know what this one is? Yeah, some of you do, so maybe it's recoverable for, for expert vision scientists or expert psychologists. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a wine glass. And so, oh, OK. Um, so, so right, so you have a contour here, and you say, OK, well, I know this is how wine glass look. And so I'm going to represent a contour. But that's not interpolation. That's contour and <laughs> Um, therefore, a paper that I have that's been under review for five months, um, uh, no, interpolation is uh, fast and voluntary. It fills in a spatially precise way that takes into account seemingly irrelevant information near the filament path. Um, it's not reliant upon prefrontal cortical structures, but instead relies upon B1, B2, lateral occipital complex, and B4. Um, it does not require concepts. In fact, people who have uh, brain damage uh, to the front, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, other parts of the frontal cortex, uh, do just fine, uh, and as do uh, species that have no conceptual machinery whatsoever. 
Uh, it also arises in early infancy, and there's some really neat studies showing that there's visual shape completion behavior in uh, infants who are 48 hours old. Um, ab culture abstraction is actually the exact opposite. So it's slow and effortful. It's subject to the will of the observer. Uh, its values are blurry with little phenomenal presence. Uh, it's relying upon prefrontal cortical structures, and there's some MEG studies which I can uh, make reference to to, to uh, make this point. Uh, it invokes conceptual knowledge, right? So when you see that dog, you need to have some knowledge of how dogs look and what their shapes are typically. Uh, and it probably does not arise in early infancy. So I doubt that any infant 48 hours old would see R.C. James' uh, uh, display as being a Dalmatian dog. So I would like to take credit for this distinction, but unfortunately, uh, Gaetano Caniza beat me to the punch uh, in 1985, seeing and thinking, he actually, and these are all direct quotes, he talks about perceptual interpolations, which are directly visible, imposes itself on the observer, resolves its problems without regard to logic, expectations, and knowledge, and he says there can be organization without meaning. And he contrasts that with cognitive integration, which does not elicit a unique solution, is easily modifiable, it's reached through reasoning, and it's subject to our knowledge, our attitudes, and our will. So um, uh, after uh, Kanisa kind of came up with this uh, distinction, uh, Irv Biederman made a distinction between recoverable and non-recoverable shapes. And actually, if you read that article, when he's talking about geons, he's saying that well, the important way they would get geons is through this filling in process. So he actually talks about the importance of filling in and distinguishing recoverable from non-recoverable shapes. And then Phil Kalman, my advisor at UCLA, uh, he talks about interpolation versus recognition of partial information. So you can see that there is this vase down here that interpolates with the cat. You know that cats don't have vase as feet. Uh, and, and so that would be an interpolated boundary you would form, and this would be a recognition for partial information where you have to use your knowledge of the, of the cat's whereabouts to represent its contour. And so a lot of people kind of independently have kind of made reference to this distinction, but people keep on forgetting about it or it's overlooked or something, but this is a really important distinction that needs to be kept in mind, especially if you're interested in the cognitive impenetrability of interpolation. So I argue that this is sort of a red herring so subjects, you know, you have, you have these, you have these uh, researchers who think they're studying one process, but in fact they're studying something else. And so maybe a seventh bullet point to, um, to the checklist would be make sure that you're studying what you think you're studying. <laughs> make sure that if you're studying interpolation, you're not studying something like contour abstraction. So to summarize, interpolation is a uh, encapsulated uh, process. It happens too quickly for knowledge to have an effect. Uh, introspection provides a little help. It's an incredibly complex process. Uh, it ignores background knowledge, uh, contextual regularity, and physical impossibility. Uh, and observers cannot create or prevent interpolation in cases where it would be helpful or in cases where it would be consistent with cons their conceptual schema. Uh, at the same time, conceptual processing is relevant in other ways for representing boundaries and determines um, uh, uh, whether interpolations are noticed or used for the purposes of shape discrimination. And cognition also is important for representing contour boundaries when interpolation can pro provide no help. Um, so now I'd like to end just by saying a little bit about um, Denon's um, influence on me. Um, so, uh, you know, pretty much my entire career path is shaped by Denon. Um, so I originally, you know, started out as a philosophy graduate student. Um, I was interested in visual objects and sensory representation. Uh, and then as, a co as part of the Cognitive Science Certificate project, I started working with Zen and doing multiple audio tracking, and I was like, wow, this is so much fun, this is so cool, the effects of are robust, this is like amazing. I was like, I want to do what Zen is doing. I want to have one foot and, and you know, kind of philosophy or think about conceptual foundations in cognitive science, and I have my other foot kind of doing experimental uh, science and, and running visual experiments. Um, so those are huge, uh, uh, shoes to fill. I, I don't know if I ever will fill them, but it's something that um, I'm, tr I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, you know, not lose sight of these big questions, but at the same time do some interesting, robust behavioral work. Um, so, uh, as you can probably tell from this talk, uh, the topics that I'm most interested in are extremely influenced by, by my time uh, spent with Zenit. So, I think that object represent representation is hugely important. Um, you know, a major goal for your visual system is to combine information that's scattered across space and time and to represent the objects that are in your field of view. So if you don't represent the objects, then you wipe out much of what distingu distinguishes vision from the other senses. So my interest in objects uh, definitely came from having worked with Zenon. 
Um, also, with cognitive, cognitive architecture, I think this is an incredibly interesting question. I think it's really important. If you want to understand the mind, you need to understand the parts that compose the mind. And so, uh, Zenin's work on that, and um, uh, especially his 1999 BBS article, had uh, a lot of influence on me there. Um, I'd also, I also have to say that uh, Zenin influenced me significantly in terms of approach. Um, so, uh, one thing it, he taught me, I think, is that you, you can't get lost in the weeds. So there are kind of little small questions you can focus on, but whenever you focus on, it, on those questions, you need to always keep, you know, um, keep in mind the bigger question that you're after. Um, so I think that, that was important. Um, also, I think that one thing I really loved about Zen's approach is that his, his research is extremely programmatic. So you know, in our field, I feel like most people kind of jump from topic to topic to topic. But with Zenin, I feel like you know, he has a few really deep, interesting questions that he approaches, and he kept, keeps hammering away at those questions over decades. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that, and something I'm trying to do in my own research. So um, uh, also, Zenin has a healthy skepticism of neuroimaging, which is important for me, because it looks like I'm getting a K award to do neuroimaging. So uh, hopefully, I'll help you do better science. So uh, overall, I just, it, it's hard to, uh, to express my gratitude, but thank you so much for all that. Uh, support that you've given me and also for, for the wonderful influence that you've had uh, on my research and career. Thank you. So let's take just a couple of questions from Ryan and I'll see if we can get Sue to come educate us about the lunch options. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, okay, um, since we've been talking about phenomenological and top-down stuff, yeah. so I had an experience when you were showing the stimuli right at the beginning of the talk, uh, and you showed the different circles of the Pac-Man facing each other. It was the amodal completion uh, yeah. stuff. So when you first put it up there, I didn't get it. Right. And then you said it's holes punched and you're seeing it through the background, and suddenly it snapped into place for me once you gave me those words. Right. So I phenomenologically had a top-down change. Yep. So how would you explain that in the context of the perception being separated in cord off and condition? Well, um, so a couple things. First of all, I would uh, distinguish that interpolation from recognition. So that kind of you know, fits with the, uh, the point I was trying to make earlier. Um, so uh, when you see that stimulus, for example, if you had to discriminate that sort of stimulus, you had, no clue, you had no idea that it was actually a complete shape. You put distractor lines near the contours. Those distractor lines will have an effect no matter how you recognize or see the object. But at the same time, there is a higher level, of, a higher level of process where you do need to, in fact, recognize it as falling into a specific uh, category. Um, and in the paper that's under review, uh, let me see if I have the slide here. So um, we actually argue that the, if you really want to test interpolation, you want, you want to make sure that, not just that you're testing interpolation, but you want to make sure that it's a good form of interpolation, that it's a salient type of interpolation. And uh, you know, this has been studied a whole lot, and there are various ways of weakening the process, such as you know, rotation angle, um, misalignment, rounding the tangent discon discontinuities, things like that. And there are ways of making it stronger, such as motion, abrupt onset, distributing the uh, including material throughout the contour, increasing the edge of length here, or having closure. Um, so in that immobile case, for example, if I added motion to that, it would be unmistakable to you. Um, so I think that's just a, a weaker form of interpolation that where it doesn't kind of impose itself on your recognition processes. So it's kind of two responses to that question. It's a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah? I think you really answered the question. She said it's snapped into place. That suggests a cognitive effect on the actual visual experience. If, I think a better answer would be that um, it was a, pro probably a combination of spatial attention and feature-based attention. So she knew what you, you had basically said what, what she was to be looking for. And then feature-based, I mean, I'm not sure exactly which display it was. Now, the, the, the very first one at the top of your slides, uh, where yep. you start showing them the circles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one? Yes. That one. So you didn't see the, the, the square in the top? 
the one at the bottom? The, the one at the bottom? bottom? Yeah, I mean, I knew that it, it, it makes a rectangle, but it wasn't until you said um, it's holes punched and you're seeing the background, and if that gave me, yep. then I started processing it in terms of depth, and then it was like, right. it, it was well, strangely different. Okay, so maybe it's feature-based attention on depth. Mm -hmm. Well, what we argue is that uh, attention is irrelevant here. Actually, the, especially when the contours are salient, there's very little evidence that attention plays any appreciable role. Um, so uh, you, you, uh, you're going to form these contours no matter what. But whether those contours are noticed or used is another story. And that's something that depends on, on uh, cognitive machinery. So that's, that's how we respond to that one. Carl? Yeah. Onsets do kind of automatically grab attention, and they're also known to um, uh, be a stronger grouping cue. So if you have edge elements that abruptly uh, appear, you're going to have more robust contour interpolation in those cases. Um, but if you just eliminate that, if I can just open this up, then if you just see the, um, the movie, or is it? Um, Oh, here it is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Right, so there's no abrupt onsets or offsets here. They kind of just, they start off and misaligned and then they gradually become aligned. And I think, my guess, we haven't guessed, we haven't tested this on the people, we just test on ourselves. My guess is that the effect will be smaller, but it will still be present since you can feel the illusory contours effects um, in the uh, middle phase of the trial. Another good question. So it seems like we were becoming dangerously close there to identifying a putative effect of cognitive penetration, which means we have to break for lunch. <laughs>